house tonight. Hope you've had a wonderful week. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us tonight. Any announcements you'd like to make us aware of? Amen. <clears throat> All right. I appreciate that, Brother Barry. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Well, somebody take a microphone. <laughs> they got one there. Um, Julie wanted me to tell all of you that She's home, <clears throat> she's doing good, and that she thanks you for all your prayers, your calls, your texts, whatever you've done to continue memory and prayer. We just left her, and she's she's doing pretty good. Amen. Amen. Appreciate it. Anyone else? All right, I have an announcement. Uh, I've got a letter I'm going to read to you. Now, Barry and Jamie, refresh my memory. This is a granddaughter. Okay. So this is a granddaughter of Barry and Janie's that's going on a mission trip. And this is what the letter says. Family and friends, I hope this letter finds you well and you are joyfully renewed following the Easter weekend. If you don't already know, I am a junior studying psychology at North Carolina State University. My time at North Carolina State has brought me many opportunities to learn, grow, and connect, particularly through my involvement with now, I'm going to try to pronounce this. This is CRU, okay, and on-campus ministry, and it's spelled C-R-U. Being a part of CRU has blessed me abundantly with supportive, Christ-centered community, loving friendships, and opportunities to grow, learn, and share my walk with Christ. <clears throat> CRU has done this for me and many others through their mission to win, build, and send people for Christ through discipleship. As such... I have been given the opportunity to go to Florence, Italy this summer on mission with crew. While there, I, along with a mission team, will be meeting the people of Florence with the goal to share our faith with them and to give those willing a chance to respond to the good news of the gospel. This trip will certainly grow me in my own relationship with the Lord, teach me how to abide more fully on his sovereignty and witness the amazing work he has 
and is already doing in the lives of those in Florence. In preparation for the trip, I am inviting others by faith to partner with me in prayer and financial support. I am trusting in the Lord to provide my support goal of $6,850 to cover the expenses of the trip. All donations will be used for this summer mission trip. Would you prayerfully consider joining my support team with a gift of 50, 100, 200, or some other amount significant to you as I try to reach my goal. The easiest way to give is online using my personal giving page, and she gives the uh, address here. Here, uh, you can also receive your tax deductible receipt. If you would like to give by check, make your check payable to crew and send the check to me. In addition, I would love your prayer support specifically for travel mercies, smoothly transitioning to my time in Italy, boldness in starting conversations, and openness of the hearts of those hearing the gospel message. Having the trip back by prayer is important to me and the team. Thank you, Grace Martin. And so our deacons have met and we've decided we're going to contribute 500 as a church. And we're going to ask that anybody else that would like to also contribute for the next two Sundays, uh, just write a check payable to the church, and then the church will make one collective check. And uh, But on the side note, put for the crew mission trip. And so uh, for the next two Sundays, if you feel inclined to give extra beyond what the church is giving, please do that. And so any questions? Or Barry and Janie, got anything to add? Uh, Everybody good? Okay. Any other announcements? And I will post this letter up on the board so you can go by and read it yourself in case you have any questions. In fact, Molly, go pin it on the board right now before I forget it and go home with it tonight. So everybody can read it when they go out. Just that board is on the board outside. Any prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say that several weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Ken and I went home from church as normal, and things were just routine until in the middle of the night, I woke up to go to the bathroom, and I fell flat on my face. Our house is on a concrete slab, and it doesn't yield very much. Ken says if I hadn't had such an unbelievable hard head, it would have killed me. He's threatened to buy me a football helmet. <laughs> but after four days and nights in ICU, four days in the regular hospital. In walks Pastor Roy, and he just made my day. I had been jabbed with so many needles, feeding tooth put, tube put down my throat. I had bleeding on the brain, broke my nose, Oh, it's just a mess. But when I saw Pastor Roy, his smiling face, I knew he wasn't going to torture me anymore. <laughs> and I just wish you all could know how grateful I am for your prayers, your cards, your phone calls. They mean a lot to me. I know I look kind of scary when they showed me a mirror in ICU. I scared myself. <laughs> but had it not been for the unbelievable grace of our God, I never would have come to this point. Thank you. Oh, God bless you, Amy. So glad to see you back. Also, we have Miss Frances Bozeman, who has, I went and seen her this morning, and she has been moved, or let me say, 
When I left, she was to be moved at 4 o'clock this afternoon right across the street from the uh, Seacoast Hospital to Tidman's Rehab Center. So she'll be there for a few more days. And she wanted to know if there's anybody available for home health care. Uh, she's going to need somebody to help her out at home. Her daughter's down for another week or so, but she's going to have to go back to her job in college. And so she's not going to be able to travel right away. So if you know of anyone that does home health care or you would like to, to stay a, a little while and help her out, uh, please let Pam Bozeman know or me know. And we'll make sure she gets the word. So that's for Miss Frances Bozeman. I'd surely take her in my house. I have all the facilities available. Yeah. I understand. Okay, then also I uh, went and seen Julie as well today. And, uh, doing great. The Lord's been a, doing a, a mighty work in her life. Talked to BJ. She's doing well. And I look forward to when she can come back and be with us. Susie just sent me a text and I said, please have everyone pray for her. She's not been doing well. You know, she was so good for a week or so. And then last weekend, it just went all downhill. She's been in the bed ever since. And so she just sent me a text, asked if everyone would please remember her. She's very nauseated right now. And so uh, anyone else you'd like to mention out loud? Yes, ma'am. I just want to thank everybody for continuing to pray for my uncle. He just turned 
Welcome back, Crystal. If you have not read her Facebook post, do yourself a favor and read it. I, I commented. I commented on her Facebook post. I said, you're supposed to go on vacation and get rid of stress. Seems like she's come home with some stress. <laughs> so read her post. You understand. Hey, uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Amen. And we're going to look tonight at a scripture that's very familiar with a lot of us. And it's Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. And we're going to discuss the model prayer. The model prayer. We, we covered this a few years ago, but we've had a lot of folks come in since then. So we're going to look at it one more time. The model prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace, and thank you for what you give us in the way of mercy, grace, peace, love, joy, comfort. And we ask tonight, Lord, as we go through the scripture, it will bring all of that to us and even more. I pray as we walk the Christian walk every day, you would lead us and guide us in all spiritual truth, that we would be an example of the believers to each and every one we come in contact with. And I pray as we go through the scripture tonight and the other scriptures we'll be mentioning that you will be glorified and honored and we will be edified and built up. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so Matthew 6, 9 through 13, we'll get to that scripture in just a few moments. We're going to look at some other scripture before we actually get to it. But there is perhaps no spiritual activity less practiced than that of prayer. You can say amen or ouch. Let me say that again. There is perhaps no spiritual activity any less practiced than that of prayer. Prayer is a privilege. And yet very few of us honor that privilege that God has given us. If you were to ask the average individual why they do not pray, they would no doubt tell you one of two things. They would either say, I just don't have time to pray. I mean... That's a very real answer. And then some of them will say, well, I just don't think about praying. And that's a very real answer. And so no less spiritual activity that is practiced than that of prayer. Yet it is the one spiritual activity that is so desperately needed in our lives. We need to have a connection with God. And that connection is through prayer. And of course, reading his holy word. Now, it's like a conversation. <laughs> You ever had a conversation with somebody and it's just a one-way conversation? They do all the talking, you do all the listening. You're trying to get a word in, but they just keep talking and keep talking. And all you can do is just nod your head and wait for them to take a breath. And you say, well, I got to go. We'll see you later. Well, a conversation with God is we go to him in prayer and he listens to us. He comes to us through his word and we listen to him. And that's how we have a conversation with God. So we pray, we read his word, and we have that conversation. Prayer is to be desired. We all need help in learning how to pray. Amen. Well, now, someone once vividly expressed this in a humorous little poem I'm going to recite to you. The proper way for man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keys. The only proper attitude is down upon his knees. Nay, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms with wrapped and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Snow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerly clasped in front with both thumbs pointing to the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year, I fell in Hotskin's well head first, said Cyril Brown, with both my heels a-sticking up and my head a-pointing down. And I done prayed right then and there, best prayer I ever said. The prayingest prayer I ever prayed standing on my head. Amen. Amen. Two men were talking together about prayer. The first challenged the other. If you're so religious, let's hear you quote the Lord's Prayer. If you can do it, I'll give you $10. The second responded, I'll take that bet. And he started praying. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. 
If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. The first pulled out his wallet, fished out a $10 bill, and he muttered, I didn't think you could do it. <laughs> oh, how we need to learn how to pray. There's a lot of ideas on how to pray. There's a lot of books written on how to intervene with God. And there's a lot of postures we could take, laying down, sitting down, standing up, uh, kneeling down. And while there are many books that discuss the subject of prayer, I tell you the Bible is the best textbook to look at in knowing how to pray. Now think about this. The disciples had the Old Testament to teach them on the subject of prayer. And perhaps King David's prayer that he prayed back in 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13 could be a parallel to the model prayer we're going to be discussing tonight of Matthew 6, 9 through 13. So let's look at David's prayer, first of all, as mentioned in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 13. This is what it says. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand is it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our Lord God, or our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Upon reading that prayer, we realize that David understood the basic principles of prayer. He first spoke of worship. You know, we ought to start every prayer thanking God and worshiping God for who he is. David then made mention of God's kingdom. And then he continued on, acknowledged God as the source of all things. And he closed it out by showing a spirit of humility. And so before we dive into the model prayer, let's discuss how not to pray. I mean, we're going to talk about how to pray, but let's first of all know not how to pray. Because there is a difference. And we find that as through the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 5 through 8. This is what Jesus says. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. So this counsel is coming from Jesus himself on teaching us how not to pray before he teaches us how to pray. He is warning of hypocrisy in our prayers. He is warning of people just flowing long, flowery phrases out to tickle men's ears. I don't know about you, and I remember as a child hearing people pray. I remember one individual in particular. He would say the same prayer every week. they call on him to pray. And he would use all kinds of adjectives. And he would talk about this and talk about that. And it got monotonous because it was the same prayer, the same words, everything. It was a rehearsed prayer. Now, let me say this, and uh, I'm not picking on nobody because I haven't detected anything like this, but let me just use this as an example. Say you're an usher and you come up to the altar and the song leader says, would you lead us in our prayer? And it's prayers over the offering. Sometimes I've heard ushers in the past pray about everything but the offering. They pray about this, they pray about that, they pray about all things, but they never get to thanking God for the offering. When you're called upon to pray blessings of the offering, don't forget the offering. We got prayers going up for other things as well, but do what you've been asked to do when you're asked to pray. 
He's warning of hypocrisy. He's describing those who have turned prayer into a performance. He says that their reward is human praise. They want the pat on the back from other people, and that's all they're getting. They're not getting the praise from heaven. Their praise is coming from men down here because that's who they're trying to tickle the ears of. The privacy of closet prayer does not discount the value of congregational prayer. We all want to be able to pray to ourselves in our own closet to our Heavenly Father, but we all also ought to be able to pray out loud and give God the due that He deserves. I know some people do not want to pray publicly, and I would never try to embarrass anyone I knew did not want to pray publicly. And Sunday school teachers, that's something you need to be aware of as well. If you're going to call on somebody to pray, ask them ahead of time. Would you mind if I call your name? Would you lead us in prayer? And sometimes they'll say yes, and sometimes they'll say no. So be cautious on that. Some people just don't want to pray out loud in front of other folks. So let's be cautious. Jesus prayed in private, and then at other times Jesus prayed in public. And so both was all right. Now, as we look in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, is similar to what we're going to read tonight. But it was two different occasions. In Matthew's gospel, when we talk about the model prayer, it was given at the Sermon on the Mount. It was, it was included in the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's gospel, it was at another time when he had finished praying, the disciples asked him about that prayer. And so let's look at Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. We'll see clearly that Jesus repeated his teaching. You know, that, that reminds me. I, I met a young preacher one time. Uh, he asked me, said, do you ever repeat messages? I said, well, it depends on what the Lord leads me to do. I said, because sometimes you got different people in that haven't heard the message before, and sometimes we go through a different phase of life, and it means something to us than it did earlier. And so, yeah, I have no problem with repeating messages. Uh, and any time you preach a message, it's not going to exactly be the same anyway. There's going to be something that changes in the message. Uh, in fact, I had a preacher tell me, he said, anytime you get an opportunity to record a message, record the message. The song will be the same. Every time somebody sings it, it'll be the same. But a message will always change, even if it's the same scripture. Well, this young guy, he said, I never repeat a message, and I will never will. I'm thinking to myself, well, son, what about all this, like the Lord's uh, prayer we're going to talk about tonight, the model prayer? You mean you will never do that again in your entire ministry? If the Lord lets you preach 40 years. And so I didn't say nothing to him, but that's with what he wants to do. It's great. But the Lord repeats his teaching on several occasions. And I find no fault in repeating a message or something if it's a different situation, a phase of life, or different folks come in and we all need to hear. And by the way, it's the Holy Spirit that leads us in all this. And so Matthew's account was the Sermon on the Mount while Luke related it to a time when Jesus was teaching at a certain place out loud and the disciples were privileged to hear the words. Uh, Luke 11, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so there was a directness and an intimacy when the Lord prayed. And so the disciples were watching him and listening to him. And they were in amazement. And so when he finished his prayer, their desire was to be able to pray like he prays. Lord, teach us to pray. And that ought to be our desire as well, to, to learn how to pray and to be more effective to reach God's ears. Amen? Now, something you will notice, many refer to this passage of Scripture in Matthew that we're going to turn to now, Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Many refer to this as the Lord's Prayer. But to be honest with you, the Lord's prayer is in John 17. 
when he prayed concerning the disciples, when he prayed concerning the Father's will, about going to the cross, about uh, the cup that he should have to take a part of. That was the Lord's prayer. This is the model prayer. This is say, This is what Jesus said, pray ye like this. So this is the model that is set before us to pray. And so we'll begin with the model prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you'll notice there was a few minor differences between Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. And so the prayer we have just read, the model prayer out of Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, breaks down into six petitions. Three are for God's glory and three are for man's needs. So look, let's look at the first three petitions concerning God's glory. Notice that the first is our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And so that is a reverence for God. The term our Father speaks of a personal relationship we have with God through salvation, accomplished by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It speaks of our relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our Father, our Father, Christian folks who have accepted Jesus for salvation. He is our Father, and then which art in heaven? And so this does not necessarily indicate just his location, but it also to affirm his majesty and expresses our faith in him. Hallowed be thy name speaks of expressing reverence for him. His name is holy. It's not to be abused or spoken of very lightly. And we hear this in everyday conversation with people on the job site, with people in the community, how they take the name of God so lightly. Uh, it is a shameful display how lightly some people take God's name. Some use it in cursing uh, when they curse or swear. Some use it in jesting when they tell jokes. And, and some use it in just exclamations uh, when they hit their thumb with a hammer or whatever. They take God's name in vain. I had a deacon one time, and I think I've told you this before, he had an expression he used whenever he was excited about something, and I liked it. He said, Great Jerusalem. I said, I thought that was pretty good. Great Jerusalem. So I, I tried to imitate what he would say once in a while, but it just it didn't stick with me. It just wasn't me. It was him, and I enjoyed listening to him say it, but it's Great Jerusalem. And so when we think about God's name, it is important for us to consider it is not a name to be taken lightly. Now, just listen to the four B's, the Revelation 4, 8. Make sure I'm right here. He cried out night and day, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. Then secondly, we think about God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. This is referring to the rule of God. His rule and reign. It is to express a desire for more people to place themselves under God's will. Every one of us have a free will. You do, and you do, and you do, and you certainly do. <laughs> oh, we all have a free will. God didn't make robots. Think about it. God did not make robots. He gave us a free will. We can choose. We can obey or we can disobey. God left that choice up to us. He desires that we follow his will. He desires to, for us to follow his will, and that's what we need to do. We need to follow him. And so God's will is we need to express our love for the kingdom of God to come. Thy kingdom come. The kingdom of heaven refers to the thousand year millennial reign. 
The kingdom of God refers to salvation of the believer. Many times Jesus told parables and sometimes he would begin like this. The kingdom of God is likened unto. But that's speaking of salvation. If you look back at the parables, when you see the kingdom of God at the beginning of a parable, he is liking that unto salvation. But then on other parables, he says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto, speaking about the thousand year millennial reign. And so think about that next time you read about the parables of Jesus. And then it says, thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And so we're to desire for God's will to be done in the earth as well. Even a casual survey of our surroundings today will reveal to us that God's will is not being done Amen. on the earth. Think about it. Crime, immorality, conflict, many folks who are starving, affliction. To have his will done on the earth or in the earth, as the scripture says, as it is in heaven, speaks of being submissive to God's will. If we were submissive to God's will, there'd be a lot less strife going on. Amen? It just popped in my mind, so I'm going to say it. That's why there's a lot of chaos in our homes, a failure to be submissive. Children disobeying the parents, failing to be submissive. Their role is to listen and obey the parents. And then with the husband and the wife, one's got to be submissive. You can't have both people trying to tell each other what to do. Now, being submissive doesn't mean you're the weaker person. Being submissive is taking a step back because you can't have two heads in a household. You can't have two heads in a church. I know some, no, not none of ours, <laughs> but I'm, that was close. <laughs> but I've known some deacons who wanted to be the pastor. Huh? They wanted to be the pastor. You can't have two pastors in a church. And there's... At times in marriages, both spouses wanted to be the head of the house, and you can't have that. And God has a direct order. He's not putting one person over the other. It's just an order so there will be peace in the home if we follow that. Then there is the second set following man's need, our physical needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, the head of the household is usually referred to as the breadwinner. The one who makes the most money in the household is normally called the breadwinner. But God is behind everything as the provider of that home. He is the one who opens the doors and allows that breadwinner to be able to bring the bread home to sustain the family. And so our physical needs is give us this day our daily bread. Daily. A constant dependence on God for our needs. You know, we have wants and we have needs. And we pray to God and we hand out our hands and we say, God, I want this and I want that and give me this and give me that, give me this, give me that. And we look at God's hands to him to just pass out stuff to us. Give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. And we're just looking at God's hands. But we need to look, to look beyond the hands, look to the face of God to know his will. God desires we look into his face to know his will and get beyond his hands just to ask for stuff all the time. But we are in a constant dependence on God for the necessities of life. And so we look to him and pray to him for those needs. Then there's the need for forgiveness. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A debt is something owed that has been left unpaid. Let me... Repeat that. A debt is something owed that has been left unpaid. Our debt to God or our failures in showing obedience to his commandments. His holy word spells out for us in a lot of scriptures how we are to be obedient as sons and daughters to our heavenly father. So we should pay heed to a debt that we owed is something that we have not yet paid to God, is our failures. We have no alternative but to throw ourselves at the mercy of God. Every one of us need the mercy of God 
in our daily walk with him. The message of the gospel is that forgiveness is always available to those who will repent. Our repentance brings God's forgiveness. Amen. To ask God to forgive us our debts is to confess our sins to him. Now, this scripture is not on the board. I don't want to throw you off. But uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To say we forgive our debtors is to show compassion to those who are in debt to us. We show compassion to them. And then there's our plea for protection. Lead us not from temptation, but deliver us from evil. Temptation means trials, troubles. The areas of life we go into where the devil afflicts us. We are to ask God to keep us from experiences which we might yield to in human weaknesses. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a great verse to put to your memory. I have called upon this verse many times over because we all deal with temptation. Even Jesus was tempted. Huh? Even Jesus was tempted. Being tempted doesn't mean you yield to sin. Being tempted means the devil's trying to get you to do something to pull you away from God's will. So here's that verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now get this. God never promised to keep us from the temptation. Because the Bible clearly says in the verse that you see on that screen, there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you or permit you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape. He'll, he'll make a doorway for you to go out of. So you may be able to bear it. Make a way to escape. Think about Joseph. Remember when Potiphar's wife threw herself upon Joseph? They say, lay with me, Joseph. And Joseph, I'm not going to do this thing. I've never sinned against my God. I'm not going to sin against your husband, and I'm not going to lay with you. And Joseph wriggled out of his coat and got out the door. Most men would have probably said, okay. All right. I mean, you caught me. I can't go nowhere. But not Joseph, because his heart was right with God. There'll be a way of escape if we look for it. I don't think many of us look for that way of escape when we're tempted. In fact, it reminds me of a little boy who went, who was wanting to go swimming. And his mama said, no, nope, you can't go swimming. I'm not going to let you go swimming. And he kept going and kept on. And I'm not going to let you go swimming. And one day they went off on a trip somewhere. And she looked and he had something underneath his shirt. She said, what is that? It was a bathing suit. She said, I told you we're not going swimming. She, he said, yeah, but I thought maybe you might change your mind. So I'm going to be ready. That's the way many of us treat temptation. We invite it in, and we're going to make ourselves open just in case it works out. But be like Joseph. Run from it. Shirk yourself out of that coat and get out the door just as fast as you can. That's what the Bible teaches us. And then the model prayer closes with a doxology. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There should always be a time of praise in our prayers. In the beginning all the way through to the ending. It acknowledges God's sovereignty. And the word amen simply, uh, it simply means I agree. So when somebody says amen while the preacher's preaching, uh, what you're saying is I agree with what you're saying. Huh? Let me hear you say that one time. Amen. I agree with what you're saying. That's what it means. But then there's something else to take notice of. Notice what Jesus says in verses 14 and 15 of the same chapter. 
as he continues on the subject of forgiveness. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The word for is a conjunction word. It is connecting one thought to another thought. It is a continuation of a previous subject. The subject being forgiveness. Jesus wanted to reiterate the subject of forgiveness. He wants us, I believe, to get a handle on this forgiveness thing. It's a big deal. Because a lot of us are trying to operate in the ministry and we harbor grudges. We harbor ill will towards others for a wrong they've done us. And so we brush each other off so casually and think nothing of it. But God doesn't. It's a big deal with God when we refuse to forgive others. Now let me ask you a question. Are we forgiven by God because we forgive others? Now think about that. Are we forgiven by God because we forgive others? Consider this then. Forgiveness is not granted as a reward for forgiving others or withheld because we fail to forgive. The proof, the proof that you and I are forgiven is that we forgive others. We forgive others. God forgives us. Clara Barton founder of the American Red Cross, was reminded one day of a vicious deed that someone had done to her years before. But she acted as if she had never heard of the incident. Don't you remember it? Her friend asked. Barton's reply was this. No, I distinctly remember forgetting it. Huh? I distinctly remember forgetting all about it. And that's the way we want to be. When somebody does this wrong, the only person we hold prisoner many times is ourselves by holding on to the hurt, holding on to the unforgiveness. D.L. Moody once said, show me a church where there is love and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. In Chicago, a few years ago, the story is told of a little boy who attended a Sunday school. When his parents moved to another part of the town, the little fella still attended the same Sunday school, although it meant a long, tiresome walk each way. A friend asked him one day why he went so far to Sunday school and told him there were plenty of other churches nearer, closer by you can go to. The little boy said, well, they may be as good for others, but they're not for me. And his friend said, well, why not? And he said, because they love a fellow over there. If only we could make the world believe that we truly love them as Christ loves us. But there is the problem. We can love others when they do us good. They give us presents. Man, we love them to death. But let somebody mistreat us. How's our love then? You see, the way to measure our love is how Jesus treated others that mistreated him. Even while being nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And ones that hurt you and me, that offend us, they may not know what they're doing either. They're being spiteful. They're being deceitful. They're being cruel, even at times. But you and I who know the love of God realize they don't know God like we know God. And so we need to have the love of God. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because if they knew, they wouldn't be treating me like this. And they wouldn't be treating you like this either. Let love replace duty in our church relations and the world will soon be evangelized. You know what I love about our church? Many times when people testify of when they came here, what brought them here, what kept them here rather, was the love they felt as they walked through the door and as they kept coming. I will never lose that. 
it may mean the difference between somebody who's having a real bad day and who can have a great day because you show them some love. Any comments, any testimonies? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful, Lord, for the day you've given us, and thank you for this study tonight. May we go home and meditate upon it. And may you be honored in all that we do. Pray that you'll help us to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.